Okay, welcome everyone. Welcome again to another My Story, uh, our 10th our to be precise. Um, a few thank yous. Uh, thank you to Caroline uh, in the office for again setting up the Zoom meeting. Um, also thank you to Rabbi Ellie and Gillian Key for sharing the workload and always being so supportive. So firstly, I'd like to introduce and welcome our two speakers, um, my story in stereo. Um, firstly, Laurie Wiseman. Laurie is uh, a much loved and very active member of South Hampstead Synagogue. Uh, thank God Laurie is now well on the road to making a full recovery from COVID-19 after fighting for his life in the intensive care unit at the Royal Free Hospital. Uh, Laurie started his career as a broadcast journalist at TVAM and made documentaries for a number of years. Laurie then moved on and for the last 30 years he has been involved in digital innovations in healthcare. So he'll bring a unique perspective on this most terrifying of patient experiences. Rachel Anticoni has been the Chief Operating Officer at the Royal Free since 2017. Rachel qualified as a nurse in 1990 and spent a significant time working in African countries affected by war, including Sudan and Rwanda. Back in the UK, she made a career in operational management in the NHS. She has also worked in community, private and charity settings. Rachel is a trustee of Jewish Care and is chair of their Clinical Governance Committee. Many of you would have seen Rachel in the recent BBC documentary titled Hospital Special Fighting COVID-19. The BBC crew could only interview her by trotting in her wake as she rushed from meeting to meeting. The responsibilities on her were enormous and the decisions she made were crucial. Rachel and Laurie, a very big welcome to you. Um, and I will hand virtually the microphone over to you, Rachel. Thank you so much, Lawrence, for that lovely introduction. And thank you, everybody, for welcoming um, me, especially as I'm a, an outsider of your community. Um, uh, I have to say, um, the first, I, I, I know I've met Laurie before, and, and we can't think where, probably through Mark Gordon, Caroline Marcus connection. Um, however, the first I heard um, Laurie's name a few months ago um, was in an email um, asking where his rucksack was um, and um, Charlotte had, had written um, to find, try and find out where his rucksack was and um, may sound quite banal um, but actually patient's property became a big issue at the Royal Free because as patients um, were admitted onto a ward um, and then um, rapidly transferred to intensive care. We were not allowed to send their belongings with them into intensive care and nor were we um, allowed to have their um, items with them in a, in a COVID ward. Um, so in trying to keep everything connected we, we, we got into a bit of a muddle with people's um, property of which one was the missing backpack um, which actually, Laurie, I think um, we did find, didn't we? And yes. we patriated you with your um, with your backpack. Yeah. So a week after discharge, it it turned <laughs> up by some kind of miracle, and the problem was it had my glasses in, and I'm pretty short sighted as well as my mobile phone. So for most of the time I was in the Royal Free, I couldn't see anything that was going on, which in some respects was a blessing. <laughs> Laurie, I, 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 we said we were going to have like. Um, a sort of a two-way chat and, and whilst yes. I like to um, think of myself as some sort of Emily Maitlis, Jeremy Paxman type character, yes. we wanted it to be a fireside chat, just the two of us. But I think um, what I really want to know, and we specifically in, in our prep for this, didn't give too much away to each other. 
Uh, but what I did see was the most beautiful letter you wrote to your friends and family after your, um, your admission, um, which talked very poignantly about, um, but in a summary about your, your journey. And I hope that this morning we can cover a bit more of that because I really, first of all, wanted to know about the events leading up to your admission. Um, sure, I, I, got, I got ill a, a week before lockdown, so about the 15th of March. I, I, I came, my, my first symptoms was just a sore throat and I'd been acting normally the week before and going around, being on the tube, going to the theatre. And on that Sunday afternoon, I came down with a sore throat and said, this feels a bit strange. And I uh, then um, felt more unwell the next day. And we decided to isolate myself in my, my son's room at the top of the house where he'd, been, he'd moved out to a flat uh, himself. So we had a spare room up there. So I was, I was isolated for a week up there and I gradually got worse and worse and worse. And by that, I mean, I, I mean the symptoms vary with everyone, but my, my symptoms were just feeling just dreadful. I had a cough, but not a severe cough. Uh, and um, by, by the following Sunday, I, I felt so awful that um, my wife actually phoned up uh, Ricky Marcus, who's actually on this uh, Zoom today, who's a doctor. And he said, well, just ring up 111, which I did. And they told me, it sounds like you've got COVID and it's quite serious. Uh, you should go to A&E and you can either wait um, five hours for an ambulance at that point or walk. And I live very close to the Wolf as you know, Rachel. So um, my, uh, I put a mask on. <laughs> uh, my, my daughter, Isabel, accompanied me down the road and around the corner very gingerly to the, um, to the A&E. And that's where I arrived on the, on the, uh, Sunday afternoon, um, feeling it's fair to say very rotten. Um, and, and the context for this, by the way, is so. First of all, I must excuse you. I'm I'm wearing headphones and using this because um, one of one of what's happened to me since is that um, as a result of the uh, what happened, I, I, my voice uh, due to the intubation became sore. It, it affected my larynx a bit, and it's gradually coming back. But and and it's not bad now. But um, when I came out of hospital, I had no voice at all. So excuse me for using these headphones. But um, So um, I arrived at a &E, uh, they did all the tests. It was quickly clear that I had COVID and I was in A&E uh, all night. Um, I, there was apparently, and you can enlighten me, Rachel, there was apparently no bed available at that point. And I, um, uh, so I was in there all night and then went up to uh, the uh, 12th floor, 12 North, and I was given a private room, <laughs> which was, and I remember thinking I've arrived in heaven because suddenly I could actually have a bed I could sleep in because as you know in A&E, they're, they're sort of treatment beds, you can't really sleep. And within 24 hours, um, I collapsed. I, I have no memory quite of what happened. I. Um, I know I was sent down to ICU, but the precise circumstances and what actually happened to me, I have absolutely no memory of. Um, uh, and so I went down to ICU. Um, and um, what I learned afterwards uh, from Charlotte, my wife, um, was that I'd been put, I was put on a ventilator. And at the time, as I said, afterwards, when I came out of ICU and Charlotte told me this, I thought she was joking. I had no idea I'd been on a ventilator, which is quite interesting, actually. The doctors actually didn't precisely tell me that when I was um, in ICU. And uh, clearly I was very unwell at this point, unable to breathe on, on you know, they intubated me, put all the stuff in me uh, and put me into a semi-coma, um, which is what you're put into so you can go on the ventilator and they can put all the tubes down you. And uh, that lasted for five days, um, so I'm told. <laughs> um, and um, at this point, of course, my, my family had, were told what was going on and you can imagine what, what, what they were going through, um, which was just horrendous and terrible. Uh, and um, what I didn't know at that time was the chance of survival. I think this is correct, Rachel, from, from 
uh, from ventilation at that point was about 30%. So 30% of people, when they go down to ICU, put on a ventilator, survive. So the statistics were quite stark. Um, and um, because they put you on this, uh, uh, they sedate you and you're in a semi-coma, um, my memory of that period is actually dominated by some hallucinations, very strange hallucinations that, that stay with me. And, and some of these are quite difficult to relate because they're obviously very um, um, traumatic in some respects, but I will tell you a few of them. Some of them are funny, some of them are less funny. The less funny one is that um, I imagine my own death uh, and I could see, I could hear my family crying in one room. I imagine myself dying and I could see the funeral. I can't tell you which cemetery, <laughs> whether it, it was bushy or elsewhere. Uh, and I could imagine, uh, I, I could see a kind of socially distanced funeral with people for some reason in a circle. Um, and, um, and it was extremely vivid, extremely vivid. Uh, and I, I, and um, at that point, when I was imagining my funeral, the weirdest thing, you have these very weird thoughts. I thought between the funeral, between my death and my funeral, somehow I would have the chance to um, write some words that my family and friends could speak, could speak at my funeral, mostly in praise of my family who had supported me obviously all the way. And somehow I'd have access to a pen and paper and after my death, I'd be able to write. Utterly bizarre. Uh, and that's what I had this amazing sensation, a very clear sensation that that's what I would do. Um, I then imagine- that, Laurie. Can I, yes. Can I, can I butt in at this point sure. and, and ask a probing question about yes. um, the, you know, the, uh, your, Right, the, the statistics of, of, of patients with COVID-19 um, being admitted into ITU and, and coming out alive are not great. I have to must plug the Royal Free at this point um, because our, our statistics are, are about 70% come out oh, really? alive, which is oh, good. very good against the national data. Um, uh, but but just can I just ask about how, how does that make you feel now looking back um, that you've had, you had, um, you know, hallucinations and yet, you know, about your own death and stuff. And how does it, without wanting to be too morbid, how does it feel now being back home with your family? How, how close that scrape was? Um, uh, it's an interesting question to self-analyze at the moment. When I first came back, all I said is to everyone, I'm alive, I'm alive in, in a kind of, in a sort of friends in repetition. Uh, uh, at every moment, I was appreciated the fact that your ho wonderful hospital and the staff there had saved my life. And that I was at home and I just couldn't believe it. Um, uh, looking back on it now, and I think it is a process to go through psychologically to appreciate what you've been through and how close to death you were. Um, I, I guess I have two choices uh, and um, one can say, well, I got through that and I survived and thank God I'm alive. Or you become, you can become morbidly fascinated with it and think that there's also another virus or something else around the corner that could similarly strike you down. You, you and, described in, in your letter to your, the family, to your family and friends about that moment that you arrived back from hospital, which happened to coincide with yes. 8 p.m. on a Thursday. Yes. Do you want to describe that? Yes. So um, I was in ICU for um, 12 days in total. Um, and uh, the most poignant moment there was when your wonderful ICU consultant said to me, um, uh, Jim Buckley, turned to me uh, and I was holding his hand, grasping at them. And bear in mind, as a COVID patient, you don't see any family or friends. Of course, no, there are no visitors allowed. Uh, understandably. So every time I saw a doctor, I would, <laughs> I would grasp them. And he said, um, you know, I said, I'm not going to live, Jim. And he said to me, no BS, no BS, Laurie, you are going to live. Don't worry. And that was the turning point for me because someone with absolute authority that I completely trusted. Um, and, and that's the brilliance of those consultants is not only their technical skills, 
but their skills in communicating with authority and integrity and such the patient completely trusts what they say in, the, in a place where you're completely vulnerable um, that I was going to live. So I went up to a ward. I, I was, um, I, I'll, I'll give the preamble to being released. I think it's quite, quite important um, and uh, to discharge. And um, I was there for another 12 days for the whole of Pesach, by the way, I was there, including Seder night, which was quite bizarre and strange. Um, and then the, it was the last day of Pesach, by the way. So my liberation happened on the last day of Pesach. And um, they came and told me that I was going to be sent home around about 4.30 in the afternoon. And without my glasses, which you mentioned, which I mentioned earlier, I could just about <laughs> see the clock on the wall of the wall. I, this, by this time I was in 8 North, and the most wonderful staff, by the way, in 8 North. I can't praise them enough. Um, and um, I could see the clock, you know, transport is sometimes somewhat delayed, Rachel, as you know, you know, you know they give you a time, it's never entirely accurate. And I needed an ambulance to take me home because at this point, by the way, I couldn't, I could barely speak. I really couldn't walk. Uh, I was coughing almost all the time. Uh, and I still had a very severe cough that was every 30 seconds I was coughing, to give you an idea. Um, and, but I was going home because I was off the oxygen by that point, which was miraculous, really. And I could see the clock ticking down and it was getting towards 7.30. And I'd spoken to Charlotte two or three, a number of times from the hospital. I was using the hospital phone that's built into the bedside um, to, to speak to her in that sort of half voice at that point. And she told me about all these people waving to the NHS at eight o'clock on a Thursday. And um, it was getting towards sort of about 7.30 and they arrived to take me home. And these two wonderful paramedics um, put me in the ambulance. When I live only, as I said, about, you know, I don't know, two, 300 meters from the hospital. And uh, we drove up our road, believe it or not, last day of Pesach as exactly eight o'clock. And everyone was out at that point. Everyone was out during March, clapping the NHS. And they saw me arrive. And um, the doors of the, the, the back of the ambulance flung open. They lifted me out and there was this amazing cheer. I mean, people were crying, my, my, my family were there. And um, I was in NHS pajamas, those green pajamas they put you in because I didn't have any of my own clothes. And I just sort of waved to everyone. <laughs> it, was the, it was the most I could do. Uh, and um, at that point, and I was lifted into the house. But that, that moment of uh, homecoming, which was really a homecoming, it was the most brilliant, wonderful feeling to be home. And um, will never will stay with me forever because it was that moment of release, that moment of knowing I was alive and seeing my family for the first time. And it's still quite emotional. Um, and, um, you know, because I hadn't seen them for three and a half weeks. Uh, and um, it, was, uh, it was a moment to treasure. It's really so interesting that a couple of things that you talk about, one is about not, not seeing your, your friends and family. And from the other side, um, when we made that decision um, quite early on and, and, and before lockdown, um, and we decided not to allow um, anybody else into the hospital, no relatives. And we've never done that before. If anything, over the last sort of certainly 10 years, hospital visiting has expanded and expanded from the old, you know, between two and five in the yeah. afternoon to two and eight. And, and in many uh, wards, it's, it's open access because you know, social structures are such an important part of healing. Um, and it, it was um, in all the difficult decisions that were being made in the hospital, um, stopping relatives visiting was, was one of the most um, torturous, most difficult decisions to make. Um, and, you know, I mean, I, I just can't imagine what it must have been like, um, you know, being so incredibly ill and, and also for your friends and family not being able to you know not knowing what's happening and just especially yeah. when you're into intubated and ventilated yeah that they can't even speak to you to hear yes. how you are well i couldn't i mean the, the psychological 
psychological isolation was severe because I didn't have my phone. Um, I couldn't see properly, so I was half dead and half blind. <laughs> and uh, you know, still uh, mentioning that story. Uh, <laughs> sorry, um, I, I, I put, put that to one side. I actually, <laughs> as I said, enjoyed not being able to see everything that was going on. Um, uh, but but it was this sense that you know, when you have visitors, you've got someone with whom you can share today's events and today's problems. And the staff, as brilliant as they were, um, were were not that. And uh, that was very hard because the simplest of things when you're that ill become the most crucial thing in your life. I was coughing all the time and all I wanted was lots and lots of tissues all the time uh, and there weren't any on the bed so I had to ask constantly and I felt guilty then asking constantly the nurses to bring me more tissues and all I wanted was a large sack of tissues that I could cough into then discard somehow uh, and you know kind of if my family had been there perhaps that would have been uh, that would have been asked for. But when you're that ill, small things like that become psychologically important. And mm. your, the limits of your world become uh, very constrained. And you just want to find a way of being comfortable and inching towards feeling better. So you're when right, you, not, not having when, family was very tough. When you talk about um, Seder night, um, and I remember that week, that was the week of the 6th of April. Yeah. And that was our busiest week um, that we'd had in the hospital. Yes. Yes. Uh, we were one of the first hospitals to receive COVID patients. We've received our first patient on the 9th of February. You'll remember he was in the press as the super spreader, um, bad name. Um, and, and, you know, obviously very, very quickly, uh, we had more and more patients and that that week of Pesach, um, 90% of our beds and we have 500 beds in the hospital, 90% of those beds were filled with COVID patients. Um, and whilst you don't remember Seder night, um, I got back quite late um, from, you know, at the time, you know, everybody was working six, seven day week and sort of 14 hour days. And I got back quite late, joined our family Zoom Seder and sat there and, and I remember feeling really quite emotional. Here we were talking about 10 plagues and I felt that I was right in the eye of the storm of the 11th um, plague. I mean, how, how, did, how did you get through it, Rachel? I mean, what, what, what did you do to, I mean, you've never seen anything like it before, right? It, it must Not in been, this country. How can you Not go home? Not in this country. But how can yeah. you go home? I, I'm fascinated how, people in your position, the consultants that go home and sort of switch off and have mm. an alternative life. How do you do that? I, I don't think anybody switched off during that time. Um, and, you know, we often have, uh, you, you'd be surprised how often a hospital has an internal incident or a major incident. You know, we run out of beds or there's been a water pipe burst and we've got no water or you know, there's a, a really bad road accident or the scaffold outside the hospital has fallen out. You know, there's often really bad incidents that take place in a hospital, but what we are used to doing is mobilizing, getting it sorted. And by the end of the day, everyone slaps each other on the back and says, wasn't that difficult? Let's go for a drink or we debrief in, you know, both formally and informally. And of course with this, it's just gone on and on and on. Um, and, um, you know, it was difficult. I mean, I suppose the, the, the weirdness was that there was nothing else going on outside of the hospital. And in those days you would um, travel to work and it was like a ghost town. There was nobody else around. And we felt quite privileged to be in work while other, people, other people's lives had been thrown up in the air. Um, we still had jobs, um, we still, you know, roughly, we were still going through some sort of structure in the day, we had each other, and I work with some fantastic people, um, and, it, you know, it, it, it is absolutely 100% a team effort. Um, I think um, uh, if you saw the BBC programme, it sometimes looked as if I had the weight of the world on my shoulders. But obviously it's much more compelling in a documentary to focus on individuals and we very much work as a team. I certainly do not do this on my own. And everybody, you know, the doc 
practices, cleaners, the writers, everybody, um, and they have to try and decompress after work, ready for the next day. Not not easy. The yeah, the most not... I have to say personally, one of the most difficult. Um, one of the most difficult things for me um, was um, managing individual um, friends and family who had friends and family in the hospital um, and then de dealing with the micro bits and then the macro bits as well. Yeah. Um, and, and in normal times, friends and family who have relatives um, in hospital, I, you know, I would always go and visit that relative and feedback or enable that conversation. Um, and, you know, it, it was really, really hard, the, the individuals who were being affected and weighing that up with like, you know, big issues like running out of oxygen or something. It, it, was, it was a tough time. Yeah, and I, I think the intensive care specialists that I came across, I've got no idea how they come into work day after day and see the, uh, confronted with the kinds of scenes they're confronted with uh, and then go home. Clearly it's a profession, it's ab they're absolutely professional and there is that sort of professional uh, distance, but it nevertheless, in those circumstances with that degree of illness that was around at that point, it must have been extraordinarily difficult. Uh, and I have to say that never once, even though I was there at the peak of the, of, of the, of the plague, as you put it at one point, that, um, did I not have the, the best of care? The, the, only thing, the only thing that was missing was, as I said, that sort of, I suppose, that sort of psychological insight about what some of the patients were going through. And I actually participated in a patient feedback session that the hospital arranged, and, and I made that point, and they've taken it on board, I think, and they've, and they've got medical students now in, enrolled to feedback with, uh, to, to family and friends on a regular basis. Because at one point, Charlotte was, unaware quite of what was going on, particularly when I was on the ward, and what, particularly when I was going to be uh, discharged. Uh, and so I know you've addressed some of these issues now, which were hugely complex and challenging uh, at, at that point. Um, yeah, so I, I, you know, it's, uh, to go back to the previous point about what, what stays with me and now, uh, I think I think what stays with me now most is, is the, uh, um, is the not the thought of how close I I was to death now, but how privileged I was to get through it. <laughs> you know, it's it, it's a sight. It's a it's it's not it's it, it, it's it's a feeling of of uh, that. Yeah, yeah. Wow, that was a close one. But thank goodness I'm healthy. Didn't have kidney failure. I, I know some other people had were on ended up on dialysis. Had other problems. That in, in many respects, I, 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 was, I, I was very fortunate uh, to come through as I did. And one of the funniest things I can tell you was that um, just before I went up to, um, and I will say this because it involves a member of our shul, I, 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 I was in recovery too, in the basement. And um, the only, per I, I was so, I, I, one of the side effects of COVID, as you know, is delirium. Um, my, my family will say I'm still slightly, slightly delirious, <laughs> since I, you know, but nevertheless, I was very delirious then. Um, and um, I was convinced that David Katz, who's a member of our show, Professor David Katz, who's an immunologist, I think you may know him. Uh, I kept asking for David Katz to come and save me. I was sure that this was the man. <laughs> that was, and I've told David the story, he won't mind my sharing it. That David would be the guy, and I kept and I could hardly speak. I kept saying, "David, cats, bring David cats, bring David cats." Through through the mask I was wearing, which was you know that because I was transferred onto the CPAP mask, which is the same mask, the oxygen mask that, that Boris Johnson was on, uh, which is very very tough to wear because it pushes oxygen down. Um, and I kept saying, "David cats," and I said, "I'll write it down for you." And the real life. That was the moment I realized how ill I was because they gave me a pad of <laughs> paper to write down the name of this man that I thought could come and save me and was sure would, would come in and, and rescue me. Um, and my, my writing just sort of dribbled down the, down the pad because I didn't have the strength to write. I mean, you know, well, sometimes you don't you realize were, quite how sick you were. 
while you were feeling delirious and were delirious from COVID and probably also from all the the drugs you were given in ITU as well. Yes. Meanwhile, we were so disorientated. Um, and I'm looking also at, at Miriam, who's sitting next to Lawrence, who works with me at the free, and she'll remember this. Um, um, that we were we were feeling so delirious from lack of sleep and not knowing what day it was that we we would say that if um, if a doctor did one of those memory tests on us at the time we didn't know what day it was what time it was and obviously at the time we didn't know who the prime minister was either um, and so so we too felt pretty delirious as well Laurie I, I empathise with that feeling yeah tell me now um. Looking back, um, looking back on the whole on the whole episode, and, and I suppose tie up because I know there will be lots of questions. I'm sure. Um, what 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 were the it sounds where but what's what was the worst bit about this whole episode, and and what's been the best the best bit of it all? Um, the worst bit was actually when I was up on the ward and was coughing constantly. Um, and I couldn't, because then you're aware of what's going on. I was clearly conscious at that point. I was up on a ward for, for 12 days, I said on 8 North. Wonderful care, but I was just coughing all the time and could barely speak. And, and that was so constant, I just couldn't. I basically didn't sleep for three and a half weeks, I was in hospital. So you get more and more exhausted and tired, and, and the cough was relentless. And... Um, that was the worst point, I think, because I kept saying, when am I going to go home? When am I going to go home? And they said, well, we've got to see how your sat oxygen saturation looks. We've got to see when you can come off the oxygen, because I was on the oxygen when I first went in the ward. And that was the lowest point, because I couldn't, I didn't know whether I was going to be there for months or weeks, and, and no one would tell me, because no one really knew how quickly I could get better. Um, and, uh, you know, the... Um, so that, that was the lowest point. Um, and I, I think, <laughs> bizarrely enough, the best point was not knowing, obviously coming home and seeing my family first time was absolutely the high point. But, but within the hospital, the best point was not knowing what was going on. Actually being given the drugs and simply trusting the people around me that, um, to make me better. And... Um, the fact that I didn't know, I think was, was, was the best thing that could have happened to me. Because I honestly, when, honestly, when Charlotte told me I'd been on a ventilator for five days, I, I really didn't believe her. I said, you must be joking. What are you talking about? Now, one of the consultants may have told me, but I'd forgotten. And you do forget a lot that goes on. But so it was a huge blessing, I think, in many respects that I was unaware of the 12 days of intensive treatment for most of it. And then um, when I became aware of the situation, it was more, it was much more, um, much more difficult to deal with and, um, and not knowing where, where I was and, uh, uh, in terms of the, the sort of discharge pathway that I was on. So, um, uh, and and since discharge, I guess the, 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 the worst moments have been when some of these hallucinations come back, uh, some of the images, because I think, if I'm right, you're sort of semi-conscious. Is that right, Rachel? Because mm. mm. like, you're, not, you're not in a coma, you're in a sort of semi-coma or semi-conscious. Mm. And suddenly, a few days ago, um, I, could, I, I suddenly recalled the scene of the, uh, the doctors around me in their full kits the full PPE with the mask and everything, just moving around me and seeing the, 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 in, the inside of the ICU unit and just the vision of these doctors moving around me and adjusting whatever kit I was on uh, suddenly came back to me. And that was quite disturbing. So um, it was, um, there are highs and lows at the moment, <laughs> mainly highs since discharge, but, but certainly the, a lot of what went on does stay with me. Um, mm. uh, perhaps I'll conclude with one, one funny story, if I may, 
Really one. One, one hallucination because I know that, that I'll only put this in because Lawrence when I met Lawrence and he invited me to participate said all oh, these hallucinations are brilliant we must tell everyone about them um, so so one I imagined that um, I now know I imagined that a famous footballer I think it was Justin Fashion you arrived in ICU and now the re really interesting about these these hallucinations are extremely detailed I saw him inside a private ambulance arriving from Essex. Why for Essex? I've got no idea. He, he arrived, just in fashion he arrived, he was coughing his guts out, couldn't move, had a bed down the, down the aisle from me, uh, and um, uh, miraculously the next day was better. And came up to me and offered me a cup of coffee and said, Laurie, I hope you get better, and um, here's a cup of coffee, I've got to go on to my next engagement. He was doing, I don't know what he was doing, some speaking engagement, some personal appearance <laughs> somewhere. And I can imagine paparazzi at the windows trying to take pictures of this guy in ICU. There's one window in ICU. I'm at. So I came out and I said to my son, um, it must have been in the papers. This guy was, was in ICU. You know, it must have been covered because I imagine all these people taking pictures and the, the film crews outside whether this was part of the seeing film crews that you mentioned in the documentary. Maybe I saw those and imagined this whole scenario that span out from that. And Jake said to me, my son said to me, what are you talking about? There was no football or a celebrity in, in ICU. I said, of course there was, I saw him. <laughs> he offered me a cup of coffee. Uh, and um, it was that, actually that was the point that I realized that a lot of what I had experienced, including the, 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 the images of death were, were indeed um, uh, hallucinations because, and I've asked people, I mean, you know, if you, presumably if you've taken drugs, this is what it feels like. And no one I know has taken the sorts of drugs that, that produce these sort of hallucinations, but I imagine that's what it's like. And, and, um, uh, and yeah, that was the point at which I realized that a lot of what I went through was imagined rather than real. Or thought I'd gone through. It's funny when you mentioned the um, the film crew. Yes. When when we filmed in ITU, um, the, the the staff strapped cameras onto yes. their tummies. Yes. Because we didn't want to. I mean, one of the the, the decisions we made about access of of the BBC at that time um, was be, or, as a public service, we wanted to provide reassurance of, of how hard it was in the NHS, but that we could do this and that you're in safe hands. But what we didn't want to allow access to film crews, but not that um, ethic morally to do. Uh, and, and so I don't got where, where your um, inspiration of the film crews <laughs> did come from although you I might think, very well have seen people with with cameras strapped to them i think it was tremendously brave decision to let the film crews in because obviously they can do warts and all and you never know, quite know how the hospital is going to come across but if there could be a better advert for the hospital it was that i mean unfortunately it's not on iplayer anymore and for those who are fortunate enough to see it uh, will have seen the best tribute to the nhs and particular in particular the royal free and in particular you rachel who, with, without wishing to make you blush, was, was, the, was the hero or heroine of that entire <laughs> piece, apart from the patients, that, of the staff. I mean, the patients that recovered, some of them were, were absolute heroes as well, but you, you came across as like, just this person that could do anything under every possible challenge and strain. And it was quite extraordinary. And of course you became unaware of the cameras, I guess, at a certain point. Oh, yes. But, Yes. Yes. There were there were there were certain times when I and, and luckily those bits weren't shown, where I'd completely forgotten that the cameras were there and probably said some things that um, shouldn't be broadcast. Um, the, the 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 specific um, bit um, in the in the documentary where I asked clarification from the mechanical engineer about what would happen if there was if we ran out of oxygen and would the pressure just fall slightly or would there be a catastrophic fallout? And he repeated very clearly, there would be a catastrophic fallout and the oxygen would stop. And at that point, I don't think I was ever more aware of having a camera in my face. Um, 
and just I and uh, made a, a a decision just to sort of nod thoughtfully whilst I thought about that. But obviously, that's not what I was thinking um, <laughs> at the time. <laughs> no, it, it was think... it was remarkable the way they they, they you know, and of course. Uh, you didn't know at the beginning whether people were going to survive or not and that's what you know those stories were so incredibly moving and, and the reviews afterwards spoke about people you know grown men crying at those documentaries did you cry when you watched it oh i did i did because um i, I mean uh, many bits of it um but there's a bit where you see sean and Sinead, the two itu matrons crying when one of our colleagues was admitted into itu um, and, and I think, you know, I can say that it was a very senior surgeon who'd been admitted into ITU and he was extremely unwell. And when he was admitted into ITU, we never thought we would see him come out again. And I can honestly say that was the lowest point in terms of the morale of the hospital. Um, it was a, a dreadful point in, in the whole horribleness. Um, however, the good news is, is that um, the, the first documentary was aired on the Monday night and on the Tuesday that surgeon was um, discharged home mm -hmm. and there must have been about at least 200 people lining the corridors um, and, and we were all clapping and crying and um, it, it, it was a, a fantastic moment for us. Um, but yeah, that, that documentary was, was hard to keep a, a dry eye. Um, you know, uh, and also, you know, uh, there were other moments, you know, the Thursday night clap, um, the first few weeks were really overwhelming. Mm -hmm. um, and to, you know, if, if you um, witnessed that Thursday night clap when you're at the hospital looking out and watching all the emergency vehicles flashing their blue lights and everybody cheering. Um, you know, it was the most amazing thing and, and to thank you all for, for doing that because um, it might seem such a small act of kindness, um, but it went such a long way and it was so exciting after that first Thursday night clap, yes. talking to the staff. Yes. Uh, it was so uplifting. Um, it, it was just simply amazing. Yeah, I, uh, there there are a few things that strike me. I, I I agree, and that 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 moment I came back witnessing it for the first time, as I said, was an ext extraordinary moment. Uh, and it's difficult to know how one thanks the NHS, <laughs> and I think that's the best way uh, w we could have done it um, at that point. And it's as you say, very very simple way to say thank you. Um, and I'm guessing that that we may have inspired a few. A few questions. Yes. Um, Shall we hand over to you, Lawrence? Did you want to take questions from anyone? Uh, thank you. I'll, I'll, I'll go to gallery view so I can see people putting their hand up. Um, as I'm uh, the person speaking, I'm I'm going to ask the first question. Uh, firstly, thank you both. That was that was an astonishing uh, conversation. Um, you you hit highs, you hit lows. Uh, the emotions came through. Uh, thank you. That was uh, amazing. My question is to you, Rachel. Um, is this a watershed moment for the NHS? I mean, you're doing things in very different ways now with technology. Uh, and I suppose this is for you as well, Laurie, because you're in healthcare digital technology. I mean, do you, th do you see things jumping 10 years forward because of this? Well, we did things in those first couple of weeks of lockdown. We did things that we have been unable to do for years. So I've spent the last couple of years looking at how we can reduce face-to-face -face outpatient appointments. And in, a, in less than a week, we stopped all of them. Um, not, not to say that it can go on like that, but we do have to reduce the number of face-to-face. -face. Um, and we've increased the number of virtual outpatient appointments, which is much better for... Uh, patients and staff. You know, we're a, a, a London teaching hospital as a, and specialist centre for transplant, second biggest cancer centre in London. Um, and actually people don't need to schlep to the hospital 
um, for every single appointment um, and it's often easier for them to do things over the phone or virtually. And there are other things, the, the way um, we manage our, our, our specialties has, has, has changed. Um, overnight, um, during the COVID crisis, our whole medical rota changed. And if you think of the thousands and thousands of doctors we have, and within 24 hours, they changed the way they worked, they changed their rotors, they changed their shifts, so that we could have the highest number of consultants working at all times. Now we've, we haven't gone back to how it was because we recognize that actually, um, you know, we, we, we need to move on and, and work in different ways. So absolutely, um, it's, it's um, uh, just, just improved things in many, many ways. There's, there's obviously lots of things that have not been so good because for three months, we stopped all our diagnostics, all our outpatient appointments and all our elective surgery. Um, but for the most, it's, it's given us an opportunity to work in a very different way, which is a good thing. I, I would say from the patient perspective, and I, I'm slightly putting my hat on about the, the digital health uh, areas that I'm involved in currently and, and in the past, I think, I think part of the revolution that's happening is that as well as helping the clinician on the ground um, deliver more efficient services and become more conscious of, of you know absolute optimum use of time when that when that same technology gets in the hands of patients so they can even if you're on the wall get a picture of where you are with your discharge what's currently happening to you um, where uh, what your estimated data discharge is going to be and how that's changing uh, what the what the tasks are that are going to be done to you today approximately what time you're going to see the physio so you have a map of your your own place within the system um, i get a sense that that patient empowerment uh, and access to that to technology over the next um, maybe within five years maybe between five and ten years will revolutionize the patient experience as well as the clinician experience within uh, trusts like like uh, like the royal free uh, and it's going to happen because we have the technology literally in our hands that can that can do these things, be it online consultations, but even in the in-hospital experience can change as well dramatically. Um, Thank you. Um, I had a, in the chat, there's a question from Bobby Bray. Bobby, do you want to unmute yourself? Yeah. Bobby, are you there? Hi, sorry, it was me. It was me, oh. Laura. Um, Hi, Ruth. Um, Hi. Um, Rachel, I know you've you've dealt with other um, your crisis managed as other situations in the world um, in your previous uh, life before the Royal Free. I just wondered how it compared to what you went through at, within uh, this pandemic. Um, so um, um, e much easier because we have resources, and, and although you know there were times when we were a bit short or getting short of. PPE we never actually ran out um, but I was working in with a hospital that's um, as fully staffed as it's ever going to be and um, with people that know roughly what they're doing although we'd never seen COVID-19 before and um, other places that I've worked in the world um, there were limited a number of people who knew what 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 to do plus usually working in um, war zones um, so, um, it, in that sense, um, I, I felt safe all the time. Um, um, and, and the other thing, I suppose, overseas, in some ways, it's e it was easier in, um, for example, in, in, in managing, um, you know, at cholera outbreaks, um, which is probably the most similar thing I can think of, but obviously, um, whilst very dangerous, not, not as um, life-threatening in some senses. Um, it was very different when, when you're in the middle of um, Ethiopia or Sudan, um, when you can just set up a field hospital with 400 um, camp beds and, and just manage patients all at once because they don't ask for things like, you know, their phone or tissues. And, and I'm in no way demeaning, Laurie, what you said. Um, but, it, you know, the, the, the expectations are a lot lower. Not, and I'm not saying that's the right thing, but it, in some ways it was um, much more of a sort of a life and death situation, much more binary. 
um, that, than, than the complexities of, of, of working in the developed world. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, um, Paul Martin, I see your hand up. Yes, well, it's wonderful to see Laurie in the, well, virtually in the flesh, virtually. Um, and uh, we've had a number of chats uh, since he, his release. I wanted to ask Laurie and, in fact, uh, Rachel, do you think it would have been useful or did it actually happen that the doctors who were treating you or the, or the nurses or the staff could have been labeled more clearly? Maybe their photographs on the outside of their equipment so you would not just see a mask in front of you but would actually see who the person was who was dealing with you. I know that this idea was tried out in Israel with some success and I tried to suggest it to a local hospital but bureaucracy got in the way and I wondered if you think it would have been a useful addition to that patient involvement that you were talking about, Larry? Um, yeah, I, I, it's interesting. I think you're right, because uh, when you're a patient, you see a huge succession of staff um, uh, and doctors, doctors and nurses and physiotherapists. And um, I couldn't remember anyone's name, which was embarrassing if I'd seen them before. And I would like to have known whom they were and what they, what they, um, obviously the consultants and the doctors were all shifting responsibilities in the light of COVID. You know, they were all they were, they were moving from you know out of their traditional area of specialty treating respiratory care. Um, nevertheless, it would have been really useful to uh, to know whom I was seeing. And as you rightly say, you couldn't see their face, and most were not. Um, uh, certainly, in ICU, people weren't wearing. Uh, name tags as far as but I mean the complication of course is the uh, is the, the contamination uh, you know if it's on the outside of their of their kit um, then of course it can get contaminated and that's that's one of the issues yeah. I guess. Well, I, would, I was going to say the, the same thing Laurie um, and I am going to give the bureaucratic answer. Um, we were going through um, 14,000 gown a day in ITU alone at the peak um, because every time a member of staff goes out to go to the toilet or to have a drink or to have a rest they obviously have to take off all their PPE and re and put on new every time so to have um, sort of photocopied even laminated um, pictures of themselves on the front um, just would have been um, too complicated at the time, but I absolutely agree. It must have been horrific um, just seeing this sea of blue with these visors and, and everything. Um, yeah, yeah. We have to find a better way. Thank you. I, I'm going to flick through the pages. I've got five pages in front of me. So if you've got a question, please, please raise your hand and I'll. Anyone? Uh, uh, Marilyn's iPad. You don't look like Marilyn, but <laughs> unless. I'm Mar I'm Marilyn's husband. Can you all hear me? <laughs> what do I press? Yes, I can hear you. Hi. Um, hello, Laurie. Um, hello. Maurice Smith, your neighbour. Oh, yes. Maine hello, Zen. Maurice. This, this uh, one, Wonderful to see you and that uh, you're so much better. You can speak and you can swallow. Um, firstly, congratulations to Rachel and her team. I've already written to pals. Uh, I had a much less serious illness than you and spent uh, only 10 days in the free, but uh, I had the most uh, highest quality of care um, as evidenced by the fact that I understood a lot because I'm a doctor who actually retired as a consultant physician uh, the week I actually got before PESA the virus. So some of the television cameras that you saw were actually coming to interview me. <laughs> so you weren't hallucinating, um, but it's wonderful to see you as well. Just for Rachel, um, I'm now going to show you my badge of pride. Rachel, <laughs> I have kept my white ID bracelet because this has brought me muzzle. This <laughs> is my lucky charm and I'm going to wear this till it falls off because this to me is muzzle dick if anyone <laughs> understands me. So um, sorry if it's a bit trite but what I wanted to say to you is um, I admired your patience because they kept giving you the wrong food 
And, you know, I was trying to explain to the staff there was a kosher meal, and then we got it, they understood what the kosher meal was, and then there was a Pesach nicker meal. <laughs> so it was hilarious trying to explain to people from Croatia, Nigeria, Malawi, Mali, Romania, what is between kosher and Pesach thick. But my final question to you is, did you lose much weight? And if so, have you regained any of it? Maurice, I can't say how delightful it is to see you. So Maurice, just to be clear, was on my left for 12 days uh, in a period when I couldn't speak. No, mainly. all talk. And, and Ma Maurice entertained me royally <laughs> during that period, uh, including having a Zoom a, a, a Zoom Seder, I think, with your family. Yes, we had a Zoom which, which Seder with my family. Which, which, which was brilliant. And having a doctor next to me was unbelievably fortunate. Uh, you know, so, um, uh, yes, I lost, uh, lost 10 kilos, uh, which um, I, I've just about put on. Um, I saw my respiratory consultant this week, and I'm going back to the free for another chest scan next week. Um, and they, they say my, my recovery has been pretty remarkable, really, given where I was. And you saw me not able to speak and coughing virtually all the time. Um, and when I came home, I saw a junior, um, Rachel's interesting, a junior doctor came up to me the, 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 the day before discharge. And, and Maurice, I think you already just left um, and said, you're going home tomorrow. And I said, I can't possibly go home tomorrow. I was coughing and coughing. How can, and they said the clinic, he said, the clinical evidence is when you go home, you get better much more quickly, which I could understand intuitively, but from my state of health, it didn't feel that was going to be real. Um, and um, I said, I've got to stay at least one more day. Please let me stay at least one more day. So at least I can walk a bit. And, and your kind staff agreed to that, Rachel. And I stayed for an extra day. And um, in that time, I got a bit of nutrition advice about how to, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And, um, and, that, and then I was released that, that next day. And um, uh, I, I, I missed seeing you that last day, Maurice. You were there for most of my, most of my stay. I, I was so pleased. You know, Pesach was coming. We, Pesach was already there. Couldn't eat much. I was very hungry. I think you were starving because although you couldn't speak, I have to tell you, if there was a prize for non-verbal communication, the, look, the looks on your face when a series of inappropriate meals were delivered spoke it all. So, you know, I, I'm, I'm pleased. And, but you did have a small box of mats in there. So yes, you, it's true. You, and you look fine now. So yes, yes, uh, I'll I'm end done. by just wanting to reiterate my thanks to Rachel and the remarkable extraordinary teams and all the doctors, the nurses, the blood takers, the physios, the speech therapists who did an outstanding job. And I'll finish by pouring blessings upon the Royal Free and Rachel and her team. And also you, Laurie, may the Almighty protect you and your family forevermore. And as we say in the Zai Gesund, Alanga Tam, Alanga Tzai, Gesund. All the best. And Thank to you, Bye. Maurice, the same Thank to you. you. Thank the you so much. Um, Mark, Amen. Amen. Caroline, I can see you. you. You've raised your hand. Thank you very much. So first of all, I'd just like to say how blessed we are because both Laurie and Rachel are extremely close friends of ours. Laurie, it's just so fantastic to have you back in the fold and we're so delighted. Rachel, I just think it's really important. I'd, I'd just like to say out loud to my wonderful community here um, that the individual kind of acts of pure kindness that you did for Mark's father, Sydney, who sadly passed away from COVID, were quite remarkable. And I know that on an individual basis, you were doing these little acts of kindness, which I cannot tell you how important they were. When we rang you outside the Royal Free, as we were sitting outside the hospital in Sydney's last hours, and spoke to you and what you did then at that very moment it was just so special and you know how we feel but I would like to say that publicly and I'd just like to ask that in terms of individual acts of kindness to us your friends and to others beyond how did you keep up staff morale internally in the hospital because 
on the programme, we saw some of the most harrowing moments when your staff were so moved by, as you said, your, your doctor friend, but also other um, staff members who were just completely overwhelmed by what was going on with COVID. What are you and the hospital and your team doing to support in the way that you support your individual friends and family? What are you doing to your colleagues in the hospital? And mm. thank you. Oh, thank you, Caroline. That, that's really um, lovely to hear. Thank you. Um, so the staff well-being is, is a huge thing for us. We're really mindful that as the months go by, um, you know, post-traumatic stress is going to be a big feature amongst not only the patients, but amongst the staff as well. So throughout um, this horrible episode, we've been providing um, lots of um, psychological support for all staff members 24 seven. We offer debriefs before and after every shift if they want it. And there's been some um, other things in, in wellbeing. So lots of breakout rest areas that we didn't have before. Uh, we provided um, 24 hours free meals to staff. You'll remember at the beginning of the COVID crisis when suddenly there was nothing in the shops and the shelves were cleared. Um, to expect our staff to do 13 hour shifts and to go home to try and find some food was expecting too much. So we provided um, meals for all our staff. I mean, the funny thing about that was that all you needed to do was to show your staff card in the canteen and you basically got, got a free meal. Um, and, and that news spread far and wide. And obviously as a public sector organisation, our colleagues from the London Ambulance Service uh, began coming for their free meals. And, um, and then also uh, St John's Ambulance were coming. Um, and it got to the point where we would see the police queuing up for meals in the canteen, um, as well as London Fire Brigade on one particular day. Um, but it was nice, it was everybody joining together. But um, it's really important to, to feed your staff well when they're going through this, but also to offer um, any, any kind of nurturing, um, as well as being very ready for providing more formal therapeutic interventions. We also um, provided a free supermarket on site. Um, actually, Caroline, which uh, obviously, as you know, Maya volunteered to work there, which was very much appreciated. And this was donated food or food that we bought um, for the staff to pick up um, on their way to and from their shifts at the hospital, which helped. Um, we, we've, all, we've stood um, the, the free meals and the, the free supermarket down now, but it will be ready to pick up again if, if there is another peak. Can I just say something? I, I, I... I think the acts of kindness in the hospital were extraordinary and um, uh, from the nurses just giving me a toothbrush one day <laughs> to, um, you know, I, despite what I said about the Kleenex, which, you know, was my obsession, that there were tremendous acts of kindness throughout. And I also want to plug the acts of kindness since my discharge, which is primarily around general practice and the GPs that, particularly my GP, Daniel Gordon, I don't know if Daniel is on this call, if he is, um, he should put up his hand and declare himself because he, he was the way, you know, the, the, the way the health service works as a concerted operation, both in general practice and the hospital-based medicine, uh, provided me with, uh, particularly my family, with, with tremendous support and acts of kindness and love. Um, and uh, it makes a huge difference, Caroline, as you, as you know. They can be the tiniest things, but they make the biggest of differences. Thank you, Laurie. Um, I think on that note of, of acts of kindness and, and love, I think it's a, a very good place to, uh, to stop. I think we could go on for a long time, um, you know, having questions. Uh, I think you covered so much um, and you made this conversation so so human. Um, it's been a wonderful and really thank you both uh, for, for the most wonderful uh, talk. Um, uh, thank uh, you. Can, uh, Lawrence, can I just want one quick plug for the Royal Free Charity? If yes. You want, I, I may, Rachel may not want to say this herself, but 
Uh, I was engaged in some fundraising for it afterwards. We raised about, uh, between myself and lots of others, uh, well over £30,000. It was a COVID-focused charity uh, for supporting the staff, um, which is wonderful. So if you choose to support anything at the moment, bung them a few quid if you choose to. You can find them on, on the, find it very easily, the Royal Free Charity. Um, the second thing I'd like to say, just very briefly, is to thank you, thank the community as a whole uh, and the Southampton community and broader, the people that offered their prayers and thoughts and kind words were, were again, uh, what, what empowered my family and myself uh, to um, see it through. So there's an enormous debt of gratitude I have to everyone that, that provided uh, that, that, that support and that love throughout my illness. And I'm very, very grateful. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, for joining us.